there's Quinn. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks everyone for, for coming to um, uh, Distributed Systems Reading Group. Uh, this month we're, uh, we read the raft paper, um, <clears throat> the extended edition. Uh, and uh, I mentioned uh, before, um, uh, before we started recording, before a lot of people showed up, um, there's uh, a chance that actually one of the authors is going to uh, show up today as well, uh, but partway through the session. So, um, and not a guarantee, but it would be it would be exciting if uh, John Osher held, uh, uh, showed up. So, <clears throat> um, anyhow, uh, so we'll probably have a few more people still uh, filter in here, but uh, we're going to get started. Um, is there anyone who would like to give a, a high level overview of the paper? Well, I I can try to give a small overview, <laughs> but yeah, don't don't. So what I what I got it from it was that in in the search for something more simple to apply and to explain than Paxos or Moot Paxos and all the fundamental assumptions that it makes, uh, it it was necessary to create something as Raft to apply and to actually replicate in different systems using the same assumptions or similar assumptions that Paxos uh, uh, was made for. Uh, and yeah, basically uh, is more summary. <laughs> awesome. And uh, does anyone want to give a like, a broad overview of um, the algorithm and kind of roughly how it works. I'm happy to. Okay. So uh, like Caleb said, Raft kind of came out of exploring a uh, simpler alternative to Paxos. And uh, something I really like is that they actually said that it developed out of them struggling to understand Paxos themselves and kind of spending a year trying to get a solid enough understanding to get it working. Uh, but first I, guess it's probably worth talking about what consensus actually is. And the problem here that they're trying to solve is one of having a cluster of machines that they would like to have availability for. So they would like to have resilience in the face of failure of some subset of those machines. And the way that they do that essentially is by uh, having an algorithm that allows the machines within the cluster to choose one leader among them through which all client requests will be serialized so that uh, so that uh, clients are only ever going to receive responses from the server if those uh, responses that they are getting back have been committed by a majority of machines on the cluster. So the mechanics of what that actually looks like involve a leader election process, a uh, log replication, and there's a, what's the third one they point out? Uh, leader election, log replication, and uh, okay, it's safety properties. So the idea is that um, <laughs> when there is not a leader elected in the cluster, uh, which again, we're dealing with distributed systems. So the nodes uh, can't ever know whether there's truly a leader. They can only know whether they've observed the presence of a leader through their own communication. So uh, every node has a timeout. And if they have not received a heartbeat from the current leader within that uh, timeout, then they start a leader election process. So they essentially vote for themselves and then they send a message out to all the other process or all the other nodes on the cluster asking them to vote for them as the leader. And uh, they do this after a uh, random amount of time. Uh, we'll probably talk more about this later on in the session, but the randomized aspects of the algorithm are super essential to how simple it ended up being. But uh, upon receiving a request for votes, if a node has not voted for another uh, leader within that election term, then they will respond to that request, uh, basically committing themselves to voting for that node. And upon receiving a quorum of votes, so uh, having received a vote from a majority of the nodes within the cluster, the leader will then announce to all the nodes within the cluster that they have won the election and that they have assumed the role of the leader. At that point, uh, all client requests will go through the leader. So uh, if a client makes a request to the cluster and it goes to a node that is not the leader, that will be forwarded to the leader. 
uh, or really the node will usually respond to the client telling them where the leader is so that the client can retry the request with the leader. But then uh, the leader essentially becomes responsible for uh, managing and replicating a log among the cluster. So uh, as they receive requests for writes, before returning those rights to the user, basically before uh, telling the user that those rights have succeeded, they will send out those rights to all the other nodes within a cluster and wait until they hear back from a majority of them that the rights have succeeded, at which point they will commit those rights to their own log, uh, essentially promising that those rights are correct, they're valid, the rest of the cluster agrees that they uh, belong in the log, uh, essentially that consensus has been achieved. And then at that point, the uh, leader is able to return the response to the client. So uh, while all this is going on, the leader is sending these heartbeat requests to all the other nodes on the cluster. And all those other nodes are going through that timeout process again, if they ever don't receive a uh, message within, I think by default, it's 100 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds, then they will kind of restart the whole process again and try to make themselves the leader. That's a kind of high level overview. Anything core I'm missing? I didn't talk about like log compaction or anything like that, but I think that's the gist. Yeah, I, I think that's a good good high level. They, they, as you said, they talked a little bit about log compaction and changes to the configuration of the cluster. Like if you add or remove members mm -hmm. sort of on, on a longer time scale. Um, but stuff but, is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like, I don't, it's not part of like really like the, the core core idea, mm -hmm. but we can definitely go in, into that stuff if uh, uh, people are interested. Now, uh, maybe to pick up the conversation, you, you mentioned that the randomness was really important uh, for the um, for the algorithm to, to work or for the system mm -hmm. to work. Um, uh, do you want to kick off a discussion about uh, wh why that might be? Yeah. So I, I actually didn't talk about this piece of the algorithm, I guess, but uh, it is possible for multiple multiple nodes to realize that there is not, or to suspect that there is not a leader at the same time or within a close interval of time. And so if uh, that happens and multiple uh, nodes start an election at about the same time, it's possible that you might end up with what's called a split vote where multiple nodes end up with the same number of votes to become the leader. And in a situation like this, no one is elected and you basically need to restart the process and do another election. So if you are very unlucky, or uh, if you have like a very uniform network, for example, let's say you have, let's say you have three nodes, all of them take 10 milliseconds to talk to each other and there's no randomness involved. When a, uh, when, when one of these election heartbeats triggers, every node at the same time will realize that there's not a leader maybe one node crashed. So there's two other nodes. They realize there's no leader. They start an election at the same time. Uh, they message each other, but they just voted for themselves. So uh, no one wins the election. It's just like one, one, zero in terms of the votes. So they restart and just kind of keep trying to elect themselves, but failing. Uh, and that stems from the fact that there's no randomness involved. So uh, obviously in the real world, uh, network delays and so on exist and introduce a little bit of jitter. But uh, the randomness basically introduces like another magnitude of jitter compared to what you would expect from a healthy deployment of something like Raft. Uh, they have a formula a bit later on in the paper where they mentioned that the, uh, that the average time to respond to a client should be about one magnitude less than the timeout configuration, which should be at least a magnitude less than the mean time to failure. So. Uh, essentially what they're doing is they're using this randomness in the leader election timeout uh, config to uh, to give some buffer between the average time for a client response and the mean time to failure. And prior to experimenting with randomness, they spent, uh, I believe they said a couple of months uh, trying out a couple of different approaches for resolving these split votes. Things like assigning uh, like ordered uh, IDs to different nodes that they could use as tiebreakers and so on. But uh, basically everything they tried ended up adding a ton of complexity to the algorithm and uh, just basically sticking a call to random into the leader election cycle, like drastically simplified things. And that's something that I found super interesting because at least 
personally, and I feel like I've seen this echoed by other people, we tend to prefer like really deterministic algorithms and view them as a lot simpler. But when you actually dig into things, it's actually been my experience that there's a lot of algorithms that end up being simplified once you introduce a little bit of randomness, which is really counterintuitive to me. Uh, you see it with like sorting algorithms when you can like randomly choose a pivot to just get away from all the complexity involved in trying to predict what a good pivot is, for example. But yeah, uh, I don't know. I just always think it's cool when something that seems more complicated ends up simplifying things. And I guess they saw that here uh, in another case too, because Paxos uh, started as like one degree Paxos, then um, you extend that to multi Paxos to allow uh, people to achieve consensus over more than one decision at a time. But they actually say that that uh, that that design that design choice is partly responsible for how, for how complicated Paxos is, and that if you don't decompose things in that way and just support kind of the equivalent to multi Paxos from the beginning, uh, everything is simpler. Awesome, thanks. Um, so obviously they spent a bunch of time here, like simplifying things down, right, uh, over Paxos. Um, and I mean, Paxos is like, you know, famously difficult to, to understand, like in, in, in depth. Um, Raft is extremely popular these days for this reason. Um, Maybe to get the, the conversation sort of rolling more, um, are there any places where uh, we wouldn't want to use Raft or that Raft is maybe a bad fit or that it has some flaws? Uh, it seems like one of the issues, and they did call it out initially, so it's not like actually a problem problem, but it's definitely a inappropriate context for its use, is basically anywhere where you need to deal with malicious input. It, it, like they explicitly called out like, uh, this doesn't, deal with Byzantine anything, all of the nodes trust each other. And that would be a problem because then like some malicious node could say like, hey, I'm the leader now and everything would go off the rails immediately, basically. I'm the captain now. <laughs> yes. Don't you also have to know how many nodes are in the cluster so that you know what the majority is? Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. That was uh, yeah. also a thing that I was thinking about the whole time reading through it, in addition to the, like, the little gremlin in the back of my mind, thinking of ways to break it. I was like, wait, what does majority mean? How do they know? And they did actually also address that in the uh, the like extension where they talk about um, adjusting the number of of nodes like live with the the like gradual swap between the old configuration and the new configuration, which as Quinn mentioned, and yeah. I agree, it was a really neat system. So that helps a little bit, but also, yeah, like at some point someone needs to tell it or they need to figure out like how many nodes there are in order to figure out what majority even means. So in like big giant open systems, even if you trust everyone, it can still be a problem. Yeah, uh, on that note, I I usually hear people telling horror stories about the times they've tried to deploy Raft in auto-scaling environments. Uh, it does have these mechanisms for supporting config changes and so on. But if you have, I don't know, if you're using like AWS to horizontally scale up and down your cluster constantly, you're probably going to introduce a ton of overhead making use of making use of those features uh, so frequently. And someone like that, you probably want like some sort of consistent hashing or something. Yeah, or even um, like not just that you're going to keep changing the configuration, um, but uh, if there ends up with a partition and then because you know uh, both halves may think that they're running separately, right? Um, and then we'll come back into connection and one of them is going to have to drop and replay its logs or, you know, resubmit everything. And so you can lose time in these auto-scaling scenarios actually pretty, pretty easily, um, based on whether or not they can actually keep up with the membership changes. Actually, that, uh, I think touches a little bit on the question I had, uh, which was, I think that Raft is mostly for uh, ensuring replication, right? So um, 
if something goes down, you still have a bunch of replicas and you have a new leader, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't help with scaling because like everything needs to go through the leader, right? So for scaling, what do you do? Do you like, I mean, I guess that that goes beyond the paper, uh, but it's like, do you run a bunch of rafts and uh, you shard your database? Um, or do you have some hierarchy or something because you sometimes want to have invariant uh, in very invariance between shards or I don't know I'm interested in what people think yeah uh, it's a good question there's a few different approaches uh, and kind of the simplest approach you have the distinction between like single leader based consensus and leaderless consensus where leaderless consensus is like what I just touched upon with like consistent hashing for example where maybe you partition your data into uh, some sort of hash space and use that to figure out which replica you want to send your data to. There's still issues there where you need to either have a static network topology or a known topology or some way of migrating between configurations. But that doesn't give you a ton of availability. That helps you more with uh, scalability. And if you want to get the availability benefits of something like Raft and the scaling benefits of uh, something like a leaderless selection protocol, then you can end up with uh, multi-leader election uh, approaches where you basically do the sharding that you talked about. You might have like a hash sharing at the top layer that you use to uh, partition data into one of many data centers or one of many clusters that will each perform their own um, like version of raft among themselves to choose a leader. Yeah, this is what's called hierarchical consensus as well, which mm -hmm. may sound familiar uh, uh, for anyone that was, uh, you know, uh, hanging out with the IPFS crew recently. Uh, it's getting a lot, a lot of attention in that world. Um, awesome. I do want to touch on one other thing. Uh, yeah, Philip had mentioned that Raft, uh, the point of it is to perform replication. So uh, another place where it is not a good fit is if uh, there's not really any notion of a peer having caught up to the cluster. Uh, one of the things that Raft requires, which I briefly touched on earlier, is logger compaction. But in order to do logger compaction, you oftentimes need to have some notion of when it's safe to start compacting the log and start computing snapshots and so on, rather than replaying from scratch each time. So uh, that kind of depends on you not having, again, like a dynamic topology where things are constantly going to be joining the network and you need to start from zero. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, I mean, yeah. Even if somebody's entering and leaving, right? You can essentially draw a line and say, this is, this is the new zero, right? Like you yep. must join this snapshot and then continue forward. Yes, as long as you're able to like draw that line. Yeah, if you're doing like uh, some of the sort of like, if you're cool with your your data going all branchy and not necessarily needing to merge back suddenly, this is not a fit because you need some notion of what committed means and mm -hmm. and as a result, like if if anyone can go in any direction at any time, then suddenly that doesn't work. <laughs> It's the same thing we've talked about in uh, past weeks here with CRDTs, where garbage collection is essential for most CRDTs, but to do garbage collection, you need causal stability, and that means that you need to stop changing at some point. Actually, speaking of CRDTs and stability, um, obviously this is a synchronous protocol, right? Um, does anybody want to add? And, and this is also partly like... Um, preview for next month, where we talk about FLP imp impossibility. Um, does anybody want to discuss um, the relative trade-offs against the CRDT or something else that's more asynchronous? And then there was awkward silence. OK. Um, I. I I guess I can I can fill fill that in a little bit. So often, and I've you know seen this in a bunch of live systems where they'll have like a raft version and a CRDT version uh, for doing some kind of replication. Um, and obviously with CRDTs, you never know 
what everybody else has, right? It's completely uh, unknown. You just know that at some point in the future, in theory, you'll be caught up, right? Um, but you're not in lockstep. Um, and systems like Raft or, or systems with consensus, mm -hmm. really the, the emphasis is trading off speed for, um, for uh, understanding, uh, sorry, speed for, uh, yeah, understanding exactly where you are in the, um, uh, in the timeline and having this exact ordered sequence for your, uh, for your state machine. I guess the question then becomes, what exactly are the applications that require you to have an ordered state machine? Um, and when, like, if we're talking about um, only availability, uh, or, I mean, more like, uh, being fine with servers going down sometimes, uh, if, if we only talk about that, then CRDTs can fix that too in some cases, I guess. Uh, but they can't provide this ordered state machine. So I guess, yeah, what's the difference? Uh, and which, which applications need it and which don't? I guess something like double, preventing double spend is one of the examples where uh, having a, an ordered state machine is maybe makes it easier, maybe it's required, not sure. <laughs> Let's uh, talk about it a little bit, Philip, and uh, some of the Bloom papers and the other Berkeley uh, Boom papers, uh, Berkeley orders of magnitude. They have spent a lot of time trying to classify which problems uh, fit into like a monotonic, eventual, consistent model. And there's some surprising conclusions they come to. Uh, one of the common examples is that like an Amazon like checkout process, for example, is usually viewed as being monotonic. Uh, and they don't change that conclusion, but they give some examples of ways in which you can make it less monotonic than people would usually expect by shifting as much state as possible onto the client and moving the like non-monotonic pieces to like the end of the process when you actually check out of the store. Uh, but uh, yeah, those papers have just some really great examples of where that delineation is between monotonic and non-monotonic applications. Things like booking airline seats is another example they like to use. Yeah. Basically, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's essentially what strong consensus gives you is a trade-off of time and complexity for a consistency, really strong consistency. So they want to make it feel like you're running a single machine across a cluster. Right. And so, yeah, double spends or anytime you want to go into a database and see a consistent state. Right. Um, and of course, then there's a, a, a trade off on that because you have communication delay and, you know, consensus itself has um, uh, ha ha has a cost. Right. Um, and so uh, it can be confusing sometimes if you're going to you know, make a query, you get back one answer, and then you make that query again, and you go to a different node, and you get a different answer. And so there's a bunch of proposed solutions to this, including like, you know, uh, I made this query over here, I made this right over here, I will only read until everybody else is caught up, right? And that's an extra level of complexity, just like I'm only going to talk to this machine until I know everybody else is at a certain state. Um, or uh, you can slow down the writes so that uh, everybody replicates them before they commit them. Uh, and there's a, a bunch of variants of this, right? Like uh, Google has a system where they know the, uh, it doesn't always work, <laughs> it works most of the time, but where they know the latency between their data centers. And so they only commit things after that latency, that communication latency um, happens. And so they don't have to do the full round trip. They know that uh, I sent it one way. As you can imagine, this doesn't, this sometimes has problems, but uh, it, it works 99% of the time. They actually allude to that approach in Raft. Um... They mention it as a possible optimization that you can apply to Raft, where in Raft, as it's described here, you have that leader election timeout, and the leader needs to keep sending uh, heartbeats to all of the other nodes to prove that they're still alive. But they mention that if you don't care about clock skew, or if you have uh, enough confidence in how long it takes to message the other nodes within a cluster, then you can actually avoid some of those heartbeats because 
uh, the other nodes will know that within some period of having voted for a leader, that leader, uh, even if they have not heard from them, uh, is likely still alive and they can predict exactly when that next heartbeat should come. So they can defer the process of starting a new election cycle, uh, like slightly, which I think it might've been in the context of the configuration changes uh, that this is something they say can simplify rolling those out because you uh, avoid that issue of an old node just constantly uh, halting progress by starting elections. But in practice, um, I think most distributed systems people agree that spanner type approaches are not really feasible unless you're Google. I, I feel like too, like when, when to not choose raft, I, and I think it's general, more of these deals for the cluster is cases where like CRDT, when it's not necessarily a cluster, but you're pushing state out to some sort of ephemeral node and you just don't have those timing guarantees. Is that a, is that a fair statement? I'm not sure. I may have misunderstood you. Uh, were you saying that CRDTs uh, require timing guarantees? No, I was saying that they don't, right? In the case where, let's okay, say, example, gotcha. I have a cluster here, but I want to push something out, like, let's say, the mobile world, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, communications is inherently unreliable, right? And I don't have any of these guarantees to, you know, for the it coming out and going back in in terms of the election, even with the jittery case. But it feels like CRDTs are, are much better suited there when it's not so much a cluster, right? But still just more of the, the basics of distributed data. Yeah, I, I I think I would agree with that, especially when you're dealing with like edge and far edge devices like that, you have a lot less certainty about the makeup of your network. Uh, like Raft itself requires knowing all the nodes in the cluster. And then something like Spanner means further knowing exactly what sorts of clock skew you can inspect within those nodes. And I'd be shocked if we could ever get those sorts of guarantees in like a mobile environment. I, no. Yeah, I would definitely agree if you were like a CRDT is something that works for your problem. It can just cut out tons of complexity. Yeah. So, uh, so given I'm... that CRDTs are for asynchronous things and raft and consensus for synchronous things, are there ever cases where you can mix the two? So I actually it's just had like that idea. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah, go um, ahead. So I'm, I'm playing with TiddlyWiki and YJS CRDT. And while I'm, I'm using the CRDT to uh, sync all of the clients together that requires spinning up a node server, and I was wanting some way for the local user to spin up a node server and sync it with anything like on the cloud environment. So this kind of actually, this multi-leader election process kind of seems ideal for, for syncing the servers together. and uh with that kind of order i want to say um guaranteed order of events yeah maybe uh, another way uh using raft for crts um would be sometimes crts depend on you knowing exactly the set of clients that are connected. So you can have one server that keeps track or some kind of wrap that keeps track of the uh, members. Uh, and you need to have consensus in a way on that. Although maybe that is just too easy to fix uh, on the CRDT layer. So uh, it would be overkill to use RAF for that. One of the use cases uh, we've discussed internally at Fission uh, actually goes back to what either Drew or John were talking about with uh, mobile devices. But uh, something we're really excited about is the idea of combining eventually consistent systems with CRDTs uh, with something like Raft for kind of like short term and like transient cluster formation. So if you have say an eventually consistent system for like document storage, for example, uh, something that we imagine being useful is being able to form a raft cluster with for example the mobile devices in in your local area uh in order to do like real-time collaboration on a document achieve consensus about what that document should look like and then have the leader push that up to the eventually consistent store 
And uh, yeah, we've been thinking about combinations like that that I think are really exciting to combine things like Graft with uh, some of the problems you were just talking about with like mobile computing and edge computing. Yeah, essentially it lets us, or in theory, right, uh, lets us avoid all of these racing writes or a huge number of writes going to a single server. So you can essentially go into like a consistency mode, do writes uh, into the eventually consistent store and then go back into, you know, everybody comes together, does some stuff synchronously and then can go back out into this weakened uh, consistent mode, I guess. It's one, one way of thinking about it, but we haven't actually done this in practice yet, though I do know that there's a few um, distributed databases that have like a consistency mode um, that, that you can put them into temporarily. A moment ago, someone said that uh, spanner type solutions are not feasible unless you are Google. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I have two questions on my mind. Number one is uh, what about uh, 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 CockroachDB? which tries to do this. Um, and the second is, um, why is it that Google is able to do it and not other people? Is it a network infrastructure issue or is there a more fundamental issue in um, not being able to synchronize time in practice? Yeah, I, I think that was probably addressed at me. Uh, and this is, not something I know a ton about. I don't have much firsthand experience with Spanner. Uh, my understanding from reading pieces by uh, people like uh, Martin Klopman, for example, he talks about this a little bit in designing data intensive systems, is that getting those sorts of guarantees for clock skew uh, is like a giant network infrastructure problem at scale. Uh, where you need to understand like the exact tolerances of all the hardware that you're working with so that you can choose the correct timeouts and so on for your system uh, so that things will fall within those bounds, but while also not impacting performance by uh, by providing like too wide of a range, for example. Uh, I can't speak too much about Cockroach DB. I don't know if anyone else has any experience there. Uh, on the spanner side of things, I'm mostly citing uh, building data intensive systems as a brief chapter in here that talks about spanner. I, I noticed that uh, John Osterhow is here on uh, on the list of people. John, hi, uh, good to have you. Um, John's also been involved with folks at Stanford um, writing the Hygens paper, and so there's an interesting difference between physicists who think that simultaneity is impossible and computer scientists who continuously try to synchronize clocks. So this seems to be at the heart of that discussion. So maybe John, you can say something about uh, this question about spanner and versus hygiens and whether or not we can synchronize clocks in practice. Sorry, I'm joining late, so I'm uh, I, I'm not sure I have all of the background context on this. Uh, Paul, it's not like you were talking about physics things going on, I, and I have I know nothing about that. Uh, I, I actually think that synchronized clocks are going to happen. I think that ten years from now, I think that every clock and every computer system in the world will just be synchronized because it's not that hard to do. You know, if you have GPS, for example, you get reasonably good clock synchronization. So I think that's going to happen. An interesting question is, how does that change things like the way you do consistency, for example, and atomic operations? And I'm, I'm not actually sure it's going to have a lot. It's going to impact that. I think uh, if you look through the problems, you still have to decide. Um, uh, well, there's this problem that that you can use the clocks to order things potentially, but then you still have to communicate that information to everybody else. So even if I did something at some earlier time, which I can confirm with my clock reading, how do you at some other place in the world know that it isn't safe for you to commit your result because mine precedes it and you haven't heard about it yet? So, so I'm not sure that synchronized clocks are gonna fundamentally change the way we do consistency. Thank you, John. That was a very interesting reply. Um, just so everyone knows that uh, my name's Paul Borrell and I run the Clubhouse uh, 
room um, every Saturday morning on the subject of It's About Time. And uh, we regularly talk about computer science, neuroscience, and physics uh, issues related to time. The comment that John just made here is actually entirely consistent with the way that physicists do think about time, but for a different reason perhaps than, than he stated. Uh, what we know is that time, the space-time has a handshake. Um, it, when you send out a signal, you can get correlations at distance. And these are called you know, bell correlations or entanglements that you can appear to get spooky action at a distance. But you can't actually get signaling unless you have a round trip. This is the reason why um, you, can, you can't measure the one-way speed of light. You can only measure the two-way speed of light. So the interesting question here for consensus protocols, and I was delighted to hear John you know, express in the way that he did uh, the, this, this question about whether synchronized clocks are going to help that much, because he, he made a very important right point right in the middle of that, which is what happens when you want something to happen atomically or um, in a coordinated fashion. And I think the answer is you have to have a round trip of operations, you can't just rely on these correlations that come from listening to a clock signal. I don't know if you would agree with that, John. Yeah, I think I would, yep. On the topic of time, uh, I guess, uh, now that you're here, John, this might be a question that you're able to answer. Uh, earlier in this discussion, we were talking about how consensus algorithms are kind of fundamentally non-monotonic. Uh, as I was reading the paper, something that was standing out to me is that there seemed to be a lot of similarities with the way that Raft, uh, with the way that Raft handles kind of replacing old entries in the log with newer entries if uh, a leader with a higher term um, shows up. And that to me felt kind of lattice shaped uh, because you have these logs that are kind of growing towards the largest times that are possible in a given slot. Um, are there any connections there between like like CRDTs and the original design of a draft or anything like that? I don't know if that question makes any sense. Uh, a little bit, I'm still parsing. Remind me, what is CRDP? Sorry, that acronym uh, is- Our CRDT, uh, Convergent Replicated Data Type. Uh, so uh, like uh, semi-lattice based data structures, oftentimes. So I'm, I'm not super familiar with that work, but actually you said that Raft is mon non-monotonic, but actually I kind of think as, of Raft as being monotonic or maybe maybe mostly monotonic is the right way in the sense that there are all these things happening at the same time and nobody really knows what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And yet you steadily make progress and eventually sort of all of the, the stray branches get pruned off and everybody converges on one path. And so I think of that as, as being monotonic in that you are steadily making forward progress, mm -hmm. even though there are some false paths that eventually get pruned off along the way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's kind of the core of my question because like traditionally I've always heard these algorithms described as being fundamentally non-monotonic because coordination and monotonicity are kind of opposites in that sense. But uh, yeah, that like sense of forward progress is kind of what stood out to me through the entire paper. And I was surprised at how monotonic it seemed. <laughs> So maybe to clarify some of the terminology, because Quinn's using mon monotonic in a in a very narrow sense, um, that it's inflationary only, and so that data is only ever increasing and never decreasing and never overwritten. So that you're pruning off these other branches is the part that's non-monotonic, because you're losing information. So another word that we could use is is inflationary, and mm -hmm. Raft isn't strictly inflationary. You can deflate portions of the information that you've received. I see. But yet the set of committed entries is strictly inflationary and monotonic. Right? Yeah. And so I think so I think if you're going to allow, if you're going to recover from faults, I believe you have you can't be completely monotonic. There's no way to be completely monotonic. Because for example, a leader could start doing some work and fail to replicate it enough to ensure its durability and then crash. And so you will have to prune that stuff off. 
So, so I think I'd argue, I, I'm kind of making this up as I go here, but I, I think my first thought is I would argue that you can't have perfect monotonity in a system that is actually crash resilient. Uh, At the risk of making this a pure Q&A uh, with John <laughs> from now on, um, I, I, I would love to hear more about uh, the path you didn't take that you shortly um, mentioned in the paper, which is trying to do raft in a non-deterministic, well, sorry, in a deterministic way. Uh, so trying to do raft with like just ordering all of the nodes and um, like tending towards um, the biggest node essentially in a split layer election. And so I, I wonder what, what approaches you did try and which didn't work and why. Good question. So um, my, it's been a while. So my recollection of discussion is a little fuzzy, but, but we initially, when doing leader election, we initially plan to follow something along the lines of what Paxos does or Paxos uses some mechanism to, de to declare a priority ordering among the, the nodes in some way. And then the highest priority node wins. And so you could do that in various ways, like by, by using just the, the internet address of the nodes and whichever IP address is higher would win in the case of a conflict. But boy, once you start looking at all of the different kinds of failure modes, it just becomes really complicated with special case after special case after special case. And so, so we started down that path, but, but then we applied this rule that if it's hard to explain something, that one of us would propose a solution. And if it's hard to explain something and there are holes in explanation, that's a sign of weakness and we should look for other approaches. And, and um, one of the reasons we ended up differing from Paxos. So the thing about Paxos is Paxos does not consider availability. It only considers safety. The whole Paxos thing is just based around safety. And they just, it just, Leslie Lampard completely leaves out all of the availability or liveness stuff, which from a purely mathematical standpoint, you know, is fine. But, but from a system building standpoint, in fact, the availability liveness problems are actually just as complicated and difficult as the safety problems. In, in fact, the last things found with Raft, for example, the need for a pre-vote, that was a liveness issue, not a safety issue. Uh, so, so anyhow, once you start including liveness in it, then the Paxos approach of, of prioritizing the nodes becomes even more complicated. Because what do you do if some node has started to win with high priority, but then it crashes? You then have to be able to roll over to some other node, and how do you how do you do that? And no one do that. So anyhow, so it just got really complicated, and then we got the idea. Well, what if we just have we just do sort of uh, a timeout mechanism? We're going to have timeouts anyhow. And you have to have a timeout because whoever you elect could crash. And so just use a timeout mechanism. And then, and then we worry, well, what if everybody times out at the same time and the, so the elections keep, we never really converge and then apply randomization on top of that. So use a randomized timeout to spread everybody out so that somebody is probably gonna wake up and become leader before anybody else attempts to compete with them. So the, the end, it ended up being so much simpler to think about and to explain. And I think if you explain that to somebody, it's really easy for them to say, oh yeah, of course this is gonna work. Whereas the, the approach based on priorities just, I mean, we never actually got to a point where we were comfortable with it. We kept finding special case after special case, every solution we thought we had, there'd be another problem with it. What was the mechanism with which you found those uh, special cases? Did you just talk to your colleagues and was it like in conversation or was it really, I don't know, coding it in TLA plus or something and finding uh, contra examples? It was mostly Diego and I sitting in my office talking back and forth and kind of playing devil's advocate with each other. At some point, uh, Diego found a, um, Oh shoot, well, I can't think of the name of the program. Uh, sort of a state analysis program where you can you can so feed in systems and it'll explore all the possible states and and find errors for it. But I think by the time we did that, I think we'd already settled on the the timeout based approach. I think it was TLA. Uh, TLA was what he used for doing the proof. Um, I'm sorry, my mind is I'm having a senior moment here where my mind is blank on the name of this style of program. That um, shoot, anyhow, I I think. The answer to the question, I think it was just us mostly talking to each other. Yeah. Is it kind was of a, 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 oh, go ahead. 
sorry, was it some sort of property-based testing thing that he used for this exploring all the possible states? This is this is right on the tip of my tongue, and I just can't think of it. Sorry, uh, it, it'll come to me in another five or ten minutes, and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll, br I'll bring it back up. Uh, are you yeah. referring to COC, the proof system? Sorry, Paul, I didn't hear your question. Um, are you referring to COC, C O Q, the Q proof system? No, that's a proof system. Also. It's not a proof system. It's um. Oh. There's a Turing Award given for it about 10 or, years ago, 10 or 20 years ago, two guys from Carnegie Mellon uh, for the general technique. Uh, David Dill developed a particular program we use, and I just can't think of what it is. I'm sorry. We should, don't, let's not waste time on it, because the, the more you ask me, the, the more I wedged I'm going to get. <laughs> I need to think about something else to listen up my mind, and then it'll come to me. Something, something that seems really neat to me, um, and we haven't really talked about it much, but uh, a, a bunch of the part, a point of this paper is that like we're focusing on uh, the social human problem, which is that like you need to be able to understand the algorithm to implement it, uh, and so having an algorithm that is understandable and like obvious uh, makes that a lot easier. And it's it's really neat that like the the way that you checked for that was basically using the same social mechanism. You just tried to explain it to each other, and if it turned out that like your explanation was very complicated. It was like probably not a good fit then. I I really like that. It was honestly a really fun, really fun design process for us. We, we both had a blast doing this. And I, wow. I actually That's think fun. it's an effective way. You know, I, I I really believe that this notion of understandability is is not appreciated enough in software. You know, there's there's a, been a lot of focus lately on doing formal verification of software, and I I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I, I think it's it's the state of the art. I think makes it still too expensive to be practical in most situations. But if there was a way to make that practical, that would be a great thing. But but I think for I think intuition is also important. That not just formal mathematical, but also people's intuition that you can think about something and your mind just naturally leads in the right direction. That's really, really important in software. It's something that I, I don't think people appreciate enough. Actually, one of it's, the things, I don't think the paper mentions, but one of the things that really bothered me about Paxos, when it caused us to start working on Raft, is I got to a point where I had read, I tried to read the, um, the part-time parliament paper, which is you know, one of the world's most not understandable papers ever. And then I read Paxos Made Simple. And I, I, with that, I was, I was able to, kind of start wrapping my mind a little bit around Paxos. But I got to a point where I read the proof of Paxos in the in the uh, Paxos Made S uh, Simple paper. And actually, I was able to read that proof and convince myself that Paxos did work. But at the same time, I couldn't understand why. And that that to me was just a really bizarre place to be. How can I be in this place where, OK, I agree that it works. But I still can't, I don't know why it works. I mean, I, I can read the proof and I do the numbers in the proof and yeah, they all make sense. And that was weird. Then I, that made me think, there's got to be a way where we can actually wrap our minds around and understand why, as well as appreciating the fact that it does work. Maybe on that topic uh, of Paxos and Draft, um, in this paper, you set out with your kind of way of working with the understandability uh, and that concept. Uh, on improving on Paxos, but also solving a bigger problem than only single degree Paxos. Um, do you think, well, in, in my mind, I think there are some applications which could make use or which only need uh, single degree things. So just a single, uh, just consensus on a single value. Uh, do you think that you could apply this kind of way of working uh, and figuring out a maybe simpler, easier to understand algorithm to single degree Paxos, or at least the single degree consensus problem, and like get a uh, an algorithm that is both simpler than Raft and single degree Paxos. I think this is probably yes, probably yes. And I, I think I agree with you that there are cases where you don't need a full log or a single degree would be enough. Uh, so I, I suspect if somebody went and thought about that, they could probably come up with something that's simpler than both Raft and current Paxos. But I do want to say one thing about by going 
by, by thinking about the full problem, the full replicated log, rather than first trying to do single decree and then do the log based, is that we actually got simplicity from that because um, the way you do, actually single degree Paxos has most of the complexity of a full log solution, but it doesn't do the full log solution. And then you end up having to come back later and build even more mechanism. Whereas you, you, basically you have to have you have to have two phases to do consensus. You have to, have, and, and basically there are two phases that are interlocked. And that's that's what makes it hard to understand is you've got two phases, each of which depends on the other phase. Uh, and so what we what we ended up doing by taking the log based approach is the first phase was the leader election, and the second phase was log replication. And by doing those two phases, bam, we now have the full replicated log. Whereas with Paxos, you do the two phases just to get single degree pack degree Paxos, and then you have to do a whole bunch more stuff with additional phases in order to get the full log. And so the the full log based approaches in Paxos end up being unnecessarily complicated because they subdivided it. You know, if, the, if, if you just solve the full problem all at once, you actually end up with a solution that is overall simpler. Quinn? Yeah, um, I wanted to build off of something Sodium said earlier. Uh, yes, this paper is about Raft and the work you all did on Raft is absolutely incredible. But to me, it also seemed like kind of the more exciting part of the paper is the design process you took to design Raft compared to Paxos. and. I've also read uh, a philosophy of software design. So it's clear to me that you have spent much of your career thinking about clarity and maintainability and so on. And I guess I was curious if there's other problems in computer science or in engineering that you think deserve a similar treatment as Paxos that you or your colleagues have not really had an opportunity to dive into. Um, are there like problems that you see in this industry that just seem far more complex than they need to be if someone sits down and chips away at them? Hmm, interesting question. And by the way, yes, you're right. So I, I, I love software design and the idea of of creating really clean, simple, understandable designs. It's, I, I just think it's a fantastic creative process. Uh, as I say at the beginning of the software design book, I think software design is maybe the most purely creative medium we've ever had in humankind in terms of it's just a purely intellectual exercise of trying to build things that are clean and simple. Anyhow, uh, end of that rant. Uh, that introduction really resonated with me. I remember that. Other interesting problems. You know, I, I'm sure there are some, there are many out there because there's there's I mean, there's all these systems that have been built that are so incredibly complicated and unnecessarily so that there's opportunities for people to come along and simplify them. Can I point to one offhand? Uh, I, I, it's not coming to me immediately, but I'll think about it. And if I come up with anything in the next 15 or 20 minutes, I'll chat it or-, or Okay, it. thank you. <laughs> Actually, while there's a pause, I'd just say um, I've had I've had several conversations with Leslie Lamport about Paxos and and this idea of understandability, and he has he has just a totally different view. In fact, our views it's been interesting talking to, but our views are so different, it's almost impossible for us to even carry out a conversation. So I'll tell you some of the things he said. He said he said I don't understand this whole understandability thing. That just seems like a touchy feely thing. It's something to make you feel good. But people can think they understand things and be wrong. And so what good is it? There's no good to it. It doesn't, it doesn't get you anywhere. The only thing that really has value is mathematical proof. That's what Leslie would say. And you know, there's, there's some truth to that. Certainly, certainly understandability can be wrong. Uh, my counter argument is that. Uh, mathematical proof by itself does not produce working software. You still have to implement it and things inevitably will change as you implement them. And if you don't have those intuitions, it's really, really difficult to make those changes. But anyhow, it's been, it's been interesting discussing with because he, he, his view again is a very, very mathematical sort of proof oriented view. Oh, and he, let's see if I remember his definition of abstraction we have very different definition of the word. His definition of abstraction was uh, 
something like uh, a mathematical formal description of the behavior of a module. And my definition of abstraction is uh, it's a simplified view of an object that you get by omitting unimportant details. Leslie would say, you can't omit any detail because that affects the behavior of the thing. You know, there'll be bugs. You have to describe, everything has to be described. And so with his view of abstraction, which I understand from a, from a verification standpoint, if you want to verify something, you have to specify it with perfect precision. Uh, the problem with that is that that ends up also being very, very complicated, very hard for people to wrap their minds around. So, so his form of abstraction typically doesn't reduce complexity very much. It, it, but, I, but I'm not sure that's his goal. His goal is more to be able to prove that something works than to reduce its apparent complexity, whereas my view is more one of tr about trying to manage complexity. But anyway, it's just interesting discussions. It's sort of like talking to someone from a different country where you don't even speak the same language. and It's pretty hard to communicate. There was, about the earlier point about understandability, there's also, I think, um, a, like, a useful thing to be aware of, which is that uh, things like being understandable or feeling understandable and actually being understandable such that people understand them correctly most of the time, sort of intuitively, are like two separate things. And so you can totally accidentally build things that seem understandable. And actually, there's a whole bunch of hidden gotchas. And that seems like part yes. of the challenge of, of engineering understandable systems is like actively searching for and avoiding those particular nasty corners. That's a great point. So I would I would distinguish those two definitions. For me, uh, understandability is, is more the second practical one. And actually, the the term I use is is obvious. That the software should be obvious, and and what that means to me, something is obvious, also understandable. If somebody can take a look at it, and even being really lazy and without thinking about it very hard, they just make their first guess about something with the way it behaves or the right way to fix a bug, just being really sloppy, quick, make a guess, that guess will be right. So that is understandable. If something really is understandable, that means it makes people make the correct decisions as opposed to false understandability where it appears simple, but then in fact, they don't, they don't behave correctly. So I, I actually I totally agree with you on that, that it's understandable. It only makes sense if it's really true understandability that people can, can modify this thing or, or make predictions about its behavior and do those accurately. Uh, so we're coming up to uh, the, the hour mark here. Um, we're going to hang out and uh, chat a bunch more, but uh, people need to drop off. Totally fine. We're going to leave the recording running. Um, uh, Paul, you had a hand up. Yeah, I can, I can contribute to this conversation a little bit. I'm really enjoying what John is saying here and how he's saying it. I personally have had uh, several conversations with Leslie Lamport. I live in Palo Alto, at least I have done for 30 years, and, and he and I have had coffee. I've also given um, a talk on time clocks and the ordering of events at GitHub headquarters in 2016, where Leslie was gracious enough to be in the audience. But my experience is kind of like with John, but the interesting question here is, um, you know, who's right? And is it your intuition that's right? Or is it the mathematical proof that's right? Or is there more than just this binary spectrum we're talking about? And for example, I know that, um, that Leslie thinks that things are obvious to him and right to him because it fits with uh, Minkowski space time, um, which is what he says he has a visceral understanding of from a, a, a physics of relativity. Uh, but there's two things that came out of that, one of which is he abandons Mr. Konkowski's uh, um, space time halfway through his paper and switches to Newtonian time. I don't know if anyone actually noticed that in the original, the original paper from him. <laughs> and then the second issue is that um, physicists in general have had a problem um, with science that they don't understand, and yet the mathematics gives us exactly correct results when we go in the lab, and this is called quantum mechanics. So the, <laughs> the point that John's making here actually is, is in all of us, and all, all physicists and computer science and everyone who delves deeply into the nature of reality comes across this problem that, yes, you can feel like something works, but you know we shouldn't be too, too keen to to, to believe ourselves because unless we've actually tested it, not just mathematically, but also in, in an actual implementation. And then the other side of it is, do we just trust the mathematics without even understanding the interpretation of this? This is an important uh, point that we're on as a civilization. And I think it's, you know, computer science in particular is right at the heart of this question.
your analogy with quantum mechanics is a really great one, which rings true to me personally. I was actually a physics major as an undergrad because I hadn't, I didn't meet computers until I was well into my undergraduate career. And, and honestly, quantum mechanics had that same feel where I could understand the math, but I had no conceptual model of how these systems actually worked. And that's one of the reasons why I switched from physics to computer science. So, so I just, I was, I was very lucky. I've just come back from um, the Wolfram uh, Summer School in uh, Champaign, Illinois. I spent three weeks there completely immersed in this uh, group of physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists. And uh, it was delightful to hear uh, what they're pushing right now is this thing called multi-computation, which I believe has an enormously uh, close association with the problem of consensus. In other words, the idea that you can kick off multiple uh, um, uh, 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 computations in parallel, and it's more than just parallel computation, it's actually things that can happen and unhappen in a way that um, in all of these possibilities exist. And, and it's kind of like the, the language that John used just, you know, a few moments ago of like you strip off, you know, all of these different you know, tendrils of things that's happening until you're left with one. And, and it's interesting because the whole multi-way computation that Stephen Wolfram is pushing right now is exactly the kind of problem that I'd love to be able to apply that technique to consensus. The uh, divide between the way uh, John and Leslie think about this stuff reminds me a ton of like when the four color theorem came out and one of the big controversies there was that having this giant computer generated proof provided no intuition to the mathematicians reading it. And so many schools of math mathematicians didn't think that it contributed to the field of mathematics because it wasn't building intuition in its readers. And that feels analogous. I'm just a bit curious about the multi-computation because I remember reading about it at a time and the impression I got was that it was about saying, it's not about saying there's only one left, it's about saying they all coexist. It's a kind of multiverse of computation. Uh, I don't think there's any resolution there, am I right? Um, I can certainly speak to this, but the, it'd be much better if you go online and look at what was happening on the most recent uh, Wolfram Physics project. So this is an exploration into where is this boundary between what is quantum and what is real. Um, what we do know as physicists, and John will probably verify this despite the fact that he was dissatisfied with understanding of quantum mechanics in his early career, um, the whole universe runs on quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the machine code of our universe. So it's whether we understand it or not, it's, uh, it's not really optional for us to ignore it. On the other side of this, so this challenge that we're all having, uh, our intuition and our mathematical proofs and our algorithms that we can prove to ourselves at least that they work, um, this is a, the, the edge of knowledge of, of where we're at and being able to build large scalable systems. And these issues of, uh, of scalability, um, by the way, I was at uh, Apple's infrastructure team uh, six years ago where I tried to hire Diego um, as a software engineer into Apple. Um, and so this is why I got to dig into a few more of the questions with Diego about this and, and, had a, and actually grew a, a great respect for John and for Diego and what they had been able to do with this paper, which is why I'm listening today. But we all all of us here are on this edge of understanding and uh, we, I think, can make a lot of progress in building more reliable systems. Um, and I think that, that multi-computation is actually the way to do that. So to answer your question directly, um, no, uh, multi-computation does have some results and it's, uh, it's rather fascinating. It doesn't answer everything. Um, we know that there's still a lot of open questions, but the nice thing that's interesting about this is you can use um, something like Mathematica to do the formal proofs, which is what I'm doing, uh, of the protocols and of these systems to see how they fall out. I'd love to see someone do the RAF protocol in, uh, in the multi-way Wolfram language. That would be a great project for someone. No, that is that is something that I find interesting because the the assumption of 
um, raft is that there is a consensus that will exclude the side branches. And when we're speaking, in some contexts, we are trying to deal with the multiplicity of point of views and not as in trying to choose one over the other, but trying to acknowledge the multiplicity. And, uh, and in a way, this is what multi-computation is saying. And even in, in Raft, right, the log is trying to say, what did everybody commit? So there's this tensions between the um, CRDT where what is what can we build out of everybody's contribution uh, with with or without um, aggregation uh, technique that says, well, this is a final state other than just everything um, that we're tending towards, like the, the, the convergence, the aggregation function. And the saying we'll reach uh, an aggregation by excluding certain events, which is what Raft is doing, which is also valid in some cases. Uh, but yeah, I think the multi-computation is very much more the CRDT approach of everything happens now. What can we say about the aggregate? So this is a very interesting conversation, and it, it depends upon what your underlying beliefs are as to what it is that you find are obvious. So if we lift up the carpet and see what was swept underneath there over the last few decades of computer science, first of all, monotonicity is a, is a topic that we all talk about a lot. And uh, the belief there is that things are irreversible. Once something has happened, it can't unhappen. Unfortunately, that doesn't appear to be the case in quantum mechanics, which is why we're all confused about what happens. Um, the second is that it's smooth. In other words, if you have a smooth uh, background, with, the problem with the real line is it's a mess. Um, mathematically, as we all know, and there are some famous mathematicians on on YouTube who did describe this very articulately. Um, but the uh, the idea that, that that we can have multiple things happening concurrently, we did learn from Leslie Lamport. He kind of like taught the world this. Uh, 30, 40 years ago with his first paper on this topic. So that's interesting, but it's still a real line. And this real line is something that we are beginning to challenge right now. Is this a real plane, a real 3D space, a 4D space? You know, this block of ice that is called Minkowski space-time. Um, there, there is a joke about Minkowski space-time, and that is, why is it so flat? And the answer is, because there's nothing in it. <laughs> And, and that is, is true from a physics perspective, as well as a, as a how can we analyze what we think of is time, uh, what we think of is durations, and can the durations that John and, Die and Diego put into this raft paper, it, you know, be considered to be the same durations um, on all of the nodes and until and unless they are actually coordinating with each other. I think I, that's I'm good. Gonna, I want to jump in disagree a little bit with Paul. Paul seems to be saying that quantum mechanics is fundamental. It's underneath everything we do. Therefore, we can't ignore it. We have to be constantly considering it. But I, I don't agree with that. Uh, certainly, I mean, the, the, the world has gone, you know, went for thousands of years where nobody considered quantum mechanics and people were able to do lots of things very effectively and great engineering achievements. And I think that's still true. I think most of us, for most of the things we we do, need not consider any quantum mechanical stuff. So I so I think I would uh, I would need some convincing to believe that quantum mechanics applies in any interesting way to raft at all. I think there are places where it applies. Certainly, you know, if you're building a nuclear bomb or a nuclear reactor or performing sort of these, some huge astronomical experiments or whatever, then then things like quantum mechanics apply. But but I don't think that we have to be considering them for most of the things we do in computer programming. Is there something I'm missing there, Paul? Um, yes, but I don't want to take up all the time of this audience. So since we live so close to each other, why don't we just have coffee and, and I'll, I'll outline some of the issues for you so that we can be, uh, we can be you know, pleasant to our audience. But I would point out one thing. For thousands of years, we thought the earth was flat too. And I, my argument is that we're on the precipice of understanding something very important about time and about causality, two topics that are extremely important to computer science. This is one of the things I really love about distributed systems in particular. You can't get away from like the raw physics. Uh, you know, if you study, say, programming language theory, just pure, right? It's mainly based in logic, and you don't really care as much about like the, the physical realities uh, of it. We have a hard constraint with speed of light, 
for example, right? Um, there's a lot of exploration, at least using quantum mechanics as a metaphor recently in the past, say, five, seven years. Uh, for example, uh, Christopher Michael John, uh, I can't remember the name of the actual paper, but basically giving up on this idea of a single system image where we would all see the same data. Now, of course, that doesn't work for a lot of practical applications, but it is a really interesting approach that I think is underexplored. One of the things that um, has been explored on this multi-computation idea is that um, all of us um, are sampling only a small portion of what's going on in the reality that we're looking at. And we're not necessarily getting the same view. In fact, we typically don't. What we try to do with a log is we try to make sure everyone has the same log. My chief programmer at, at my new company um, actually wrote the three-phase commit protocol for uh, Tandem, which is used to handle trillions of dollars a day. Uh, and, um, and he basically says there is a big problem in all databases. Everyone has had this problem for decades, and it's called black holes in the log. And I said, Charlie, what do you mean by that? And he, he tells me, he says, look, no matter how hard you try, you're going to get these holes in the log where you don't have bits and pieces of the, of the log. And it, it's because of the failures and the errors. And um, it's not just the raw failures. The, there is a deliberate form of failure that is introduced in network systems by the way that switches and routers behave. And this is the dropping, delaying, duplicating, and reordering of, of the packets in the network. And it's based on the principle that came from MIT called the end-to-end -end principle. And I spent a lot of time with Bob Metcalf in the last three weeks, who was also on this Wolfram Summer School with me, by the way. If you go on to, um, um, onto YouTube, you can look for Stephen Wolfram and, and Bob Metcalf, and they had this incredibly wonderful talk, conversation about networking, you know, just a week ago, in fact. So one of the things that's interesting is, are, are our, system, our network engineers fighting with our distributed systems engineers? In my view, as a simplistic-minded programmer, I just want my packets to get there in order. That's all I want. <laughs> and yet, the folks who run the networks really want to maximize the, the, the economic value of the networks that they're building, and they always want to push the, the limits out to, to, a, to a certain point. And one of the things that Bob proved and what I proved is that there is a wicked tale. The problem is that the more we believe in these, these duriations and these, the way that things interact in this kind of way, um, it's not just the, the, the actual errors that happen. There's something more fundamental going on in what we're missing in the way that these this long tail just gets longer and, and, and thicker, the bigger the systems we get. So anyway, this, I think this is an extremely ripe form of, of research as well as practical implementation uh, uh, work that we need to do in industry as well as at the universities. And I'm fascinated with anyone who wants to, to help uh, on this journey for understanding these distributed systems better. So bringing us back to, to the RAF uh, question, I'm sure that some of you have in mind here, well, you know, there is an evolution going on in our understanding, not just in, in RAF but, or in Paxos, but there's some really excellent work that's been done in the UK by Heidi Howard on something called flexible Paxos. And it seems to me that all of those ideas about how you can, you can uh, change the, uh, the, the cohort size um, uh, dynamically would be equally uh, applicable to RAF. Um, unless I'm wrong, um, anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, personally, I'm not it... familiar with the flexible Paxos stuff, although I'm Googling it now. Uh, uh, Heidi Howard has a couple of nice videos where she, uh, so she does a compare contrast uh, Paxos raft and uh, some of her research. It's, uh, uh, super interesting. Um, unfortunately, I haven't delved into it deeply enough to have, you know, Really nuanced opinions, but uh, saw it go by in my uh, on my feed a couple of weeks back. I'm like, oh, that's, that's interesting. It's an excellent piece of work. She got a PhD on this. She's written a half dozen papers or so. Several other people are starting to to work with her on this topic, um, but she's come up with some really interesting ways of uh, thinking about this um, this dynamic cohort problem that um, is is a common problem for all consensus algorithms. <laughs> 
there was. This is uh, since it since it sounds like no one has uh things to say about flexible Paxos, myself included. Uh, there was something interesting that I kind of thought, and I don't know even if it's a like reasonable idea, but it seems like uh like Raft and Paxos are sort of doing the same or same-ish things, right? They're both consensus algorithms and they're tackling it from like different angles so that one has uh i think in the paper it was mentioned that like paxos has nice uh mathematical properties for building proofs and uh, as we've all seen raft has nice like understandability properties for writing programs or whatever uh i was kind of curious if there's a like um like in the space of algorithms or something if there's like a a uh, some sort of transform you could apply to to an arbitrary algorithm to get from like this is nice for math this is nice for algorithm implementation i don't even know if that makes sense as an idea but it seemed neat at least yeah i'm not even sure that they're mutually exclusive right like your your ideal algorithm will have both uh and the, the absolute simplest ones uh will probably have both because if it's simple to describe, you'll probably be able to describe it well mathematically. Um, but of course, you know, as mentioned, there's a difference between having a, a good, simple, intuitive understanding of something and having it be made up of few parts, right? Like those might actually be separate things, right? So as human beings in the world, we're coming to things with experience and metaphors and stories and you know, all of these things, right? Um, and as mentioned uh, earlier, you know, even in physics, there might be a really simple idea um, it tells a good story, but produces really complex math or vice versa. But the really simplest theories kind of often have both. We might not like the, the result of it, right? But often they have both um, uh, uh, both properties, or at least the ones that people often call beautiful, right? Uh, so maybe the, the takeaway is that we should um, be aiming to have really beautiful code in this uh, sort of physics or mathematical sense. And that that's extremely yeah. difficult and, and time consuming and hard. That totally there's, makes sense, yeah. It's uh, a, feels sort of <laughs> feels sort of reminiscent of I've been reading uh, Christopher Alexander's The Timeless Way of Building. And uh, like there's a whole bunch of stuff about patterns, but there's also one of the things that he talks about a lot that doesn't really come through in the software design pattern stuff as it is commonly talked about, at least as I've experienced it is uh, he puts a lot of emphasis on like, um, and he's talking about architectural patterns. So it's a little bit different, but it still seems sort of similar. Uh, he puts a lot of emphasis on like um, feeling the the liveness or beauty of a space or pattern in particular, and like seeking out those patterns that feel most, most alive or most beautiful or whatever. Uh, and like, that's a big part of what he talks about. And that seems sort of relevant here in the same way where uh, searching for elegance in that way, even if it isn't necessarily like driving home at some uh, deep mathematical truth, it's still driving home at some deep like human, social, cultural truth in a way that makes the mathematical truths more comprehensible versus like a, a, a Wikipedia sized uh, textbook full of enumerations of the four color graphs or whatever. Joe Armstrong is a huge inspiration of mine, a co-creator of Erlang, and one of my favorite quotes by him is, make it work, then make it beautiful, then if you really, really have to, make it fast. 90% of the time, if you make it beautiful, it will already be fast. So really, just make it beautiful. And that's been my experience. <laughs> I, I have a rule in, in some of the companies that I run and some of the teams, and, and I do it slightly differently for, for a purpose that combines the social as well as the engineering chances of success, is first of all, make it work. Until an engineering team actually sees something working, they don't have any confidence in themselves. But then you immediately, of course, have to go to make it right. Because if you don't make it right, it will never scale, it will never go into production and so on. That often means you have to pivot in your ideas. But if you're building on something that you already have, the team themselves have confidence in each other because they're able to make something work. That's useful. Um, the third one is to make it uh, pretty, uh, which you know essentially deals with the human uh, interface aspects of it. It's got to look and feel good and you don't want to give it to a customer until you've done that. And then the, finally, I say make it perform. 
and uh, you, a lot of and it's, it's not really in, a, in an order. It's just that the four things you have to do to build a successful project. And I learned this when I was at Sun Microsystems in the 1990s. I was the director in charge of the architecture and performance group. And so I learned to bow to the altar of measurement, uh, which is where I get most of my ideas from these days. Uh, I have a question for John. Uh, so John, you, uh, are you aware of uh, DDIA book, Designing Data Intensive? So, so in that book, the author mentions that there is a known issue with draft. So he talks about uh, one particular point that if there is a unreliable network link, so raft can get into a situation where the leadership move switches between two nodes and effectively it's not able to make a progress. So he gives a, he doesn't give more details, but he refers a paper. So I have not read it through, but uh, are you aware of this issue? Uh, with the raft. I think so. I, I think, well, so the, I, I made a, an oblique reference to what the most recent change in the protocol, which was the introduction of a pre-vote came about because of a particular failure mode where if, a, if a, a NIC were to fail such that you could transmit packets, but not receive packets, then the machine for that node would never receive any message of any other machines. And so it would continually try and start new elections. And that could destabilize the cluster by basically make it unavailable or nearly unavailable. And so the solution is this new pre-vote phase, which is talked about on the raft mailing list. It's not in Diego's thesis, because I think it came out after his thesis, but um, where before you start an official election, you first have to send messages out called the pre-vote to make sure that you can communicate with other members of the cluster and that they would be, they'd, they'd be willing in principle to vote for you for, as leader if you were to actually start an election. If I was to ask you out on a date, would you go out with me? So something like that before before sending out the actual starting the actual election, and that and that solves that particular problem. Now the one you mentioned though is if an interface is flaky, where it's coming up and down, or or a network link is flaky. Uh, I'm sure there have got to be cases where flaky networks can make the system unstable. I'm sure that can happen by again by causing continuous timeouts. And I'm not sure, I guess to me, my first thought is that's fundamental. That, that isn't something that any consensus protocol can fix. That if you don't have reliable communication, or communication is reliable over long enough periods to actually establish leadership and, and replicate uh, log entries, that I'm not sure what you can do. I mean, maybe there are protocols that could, could still live in such a world. Uh, they would need to be probably quite a bit more complex than Raft is. Unfortunately, in practice, it doesn't seem like we generally have flakiness at that level. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So this has come up in the chat a few times about things being Byzantine. And so it's not, not just about malicious actors, right? It's also, uh, you can send but not receive or vice versa, or, uh, you know, and any number of these things. And so obviously consensus is trying to solve for some subset of them, but not maybe just how far do you crank that dial. Um, Paul and then Mark Antoine. Uh, fascinating conversation, so I can contribute to this. If anyone has a, a, a reference to that paper about the uh, the flaky network links, um, can you please put it in the chat? Because I'm fascinated and would love to, to to follow up on that. But I have experienced this in, in, in the data centers. I've um, run some of my distributed al algorithms, and we have seen those flaky links. In particular, we have seen these unidirectional failures. And in, and in large data centers, these are quite common. And so I'm glad to hear that, uh, that the Raft algorithm now has an addition of the pre-vote to help solve this problem. But there is another solution I'm delighted to, uh, to be able to offer everyone. Um, I literally, for my Wolfram Summer School project, wrote a, an entire description of what I call quantum ethernet. Now, excuse me, John, for using the, the Q word again here. It's actually, it's a little bit tongue in cheek because we do use classical methods to be able to, uh, to get ethernet to talk to each other in a way that guarantees that you always um, know that you've got liveness between different links in an ethernet network. Anyway, I would invite everyone to go and find that. You can fish it out of the internet somewhere. It's just called Quantum Ethernet or Wolfram School, Summer School. And, um, and what we've done there is identified that the big problem with distributed systems is this dropping, delay, duplicate, and reordering of packets. So if we just have the smart NICs instead talk to each other, 
instead of all of these switches that are misbehaving, then we might be able to get more reliable systems. And in particular, we can manage our own direct liveness. We can manage, you know, the different kinds of failure modes that we have so that we got, you know, liveness issues and, and pre, um, you know, would you go on a day for me before I actually start a consensus operation? Sounds like a great, uh, a great solution to that, which is fundamentally in this, uh, in this protocol that I've just described to you. It's called quantum ethernet. And Bob Metcalf last night just gave me his feedback on it last, at midnight last night. So <laughs> this is an ongoing live conversation. It's a bit um, coming a bit late, but I'm, I'm just reacting to what uh, Na asked about uh, the transformation of a given algorithm to more comprehensible and or more uh, formalizable. And it seems to me, in either case, your the, the, the comprehensibility, and I suspect even the formalizability, are related to what is known as Kolmogorov complexity. What can you have a simpler description, a description in terms of something simpler of uh, the other algorithm? And it seems to me, on the one hand, algorithms are, on the one hand, very discontinuous. Uh, like there's, I don't see a continuous transformation between two different algorithms, but yet it's true that there are optimizations and there are refactorings that are going to be uh, between related algorithms. And in that way, I expect that being able to measure the relative Kolmogorov complexity on one hand of two algorithms and say, is, is this uh, transformation that augments Kolmogorov complexity, but somehow enhances performance or resilience or whatever other metric. Uh, but I doubt very much that such a transformation towards from a simple algorithm to a more complex one. I doubt very much that this is a reversible function. Um, the except in the case where it's being obtained from the simple one. Uh, but of course, that's purely intuitive. Uh, of course, you could enumerate simple algorithms and look for transformations, but I doubt that's good, practical. But anyway, the, the, this, is, this is just what this triggered, the notion that I don't think it's going to be a transformation, but I do think that there are transformations on simple algorithms that push complexity to push another metric. That is a neat connection that I hadn't even thought of, and super makes sense connecting it with uh, Kolmorogov, or however you say that complexity. Uh, super makes sense because, like, that's sort of its whole thing. Even where you're like, how it's how how small of a program can you write it in? I think is the like shortest description yeah. I've seen of that. And so that that totally makes sense for measuring algorithms if you're trying to transform them in some way. And also, I don't think necessarily that your your transformations need to be like continuous or anything. You can have uh, to to like pull on my very very small category theory understanding. Like you can do functory things or, where you're you're just Absolutely. like mapping from A to B or whatever. And obviously, with like big complex algorithms, they're going to be big hairy transformations where you need to have measures of like human understandability or simplicity or whatever. But yeah, no, that's a really neat connection. Thanks for sharing. Pleasure. So uh, we're at an hour and a half, uh, which uh, is, uh, I, I think, only a, a sign that this has been a, a really interesting conversation. Uh, we always have interesting conversations, but th this was particularly, I think, wide, wide ranging, interesting. It was fabulous having the, the author show up. Um, it sounds like people are still interested in having more discussion. So uh, here's one one place, and feel, feel free to congregate sort of wherever, but uh, in the chat, I just dropped a, a link to uh, the distributed systems reading group channel on Discord. Um, feel free to uh, 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 keep talking there. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>